Welcome everybody. Um, hope you're having a, a good introduction to Oxford. I'm Tim Dennison. I'm a professor in engineering science and also have a joint appointment with the medical school. And th the intent is to give you a little bit of a taster lecture, kind of what are the content we'll go through in a course. This is a snapshot of a module I teach to the fourth year students when they're working on their masters on the design of medical devices, bioelectronic systems, and neuroprosthetics. And so the intent, and actually what I'd like you to walk away with uh, from today, is to get a much deeper understanding of what it takes to develop a new therapy for the National Health Service. So there are a lot of lenses we have to think about, and what I try to reinforce with the class is that these are all principles of engineering. You know, oftentimes you'll think of engineering as identifying an unmet need, such as a clinical necessity, we have our science, our fundamental notions of how things work, you know, so physics, you know, from that electromagnetism, material science, and then also technical maturity. You know, can we build robust systems and the like? But another key element of engineering to think about is economics. So for you young people, how much do you think your life is worth to the National Health Service? Who has a guess? Who would fancy a guess? When they're making a reimbursement decision, how much do they value a perfect year of your life? One year of your life. Throw out a guess. 2,000 pounds. 2,000, it's a little bit, a little bit higher than that. A bit higher than that. 10,000, closer. 16,000. Yeah, it's about 20 to 30,000. Right now it's about 30,000 pounds to restore a perfect year of life. And that's important. So as an engineer, you come up with a new technology, you're not going to be judged just on how well it works scientifically, technically, or on meeting an unmet need, but you're also going to have to say, how much does it cost? And does the return on the investment of the healthcare system warrant the application of that technology? Workflow vi viability. Most of the people I work with are clinicians, neurosurgeons, neurologists, and patients out in the community throwing them an engineering you know, Python package or something like that and say, have a go at it, does not usually result in success. So we think a lot about human factors. And then this last element of the regulatory pathway has become really, I think, very salient in the last two weeks. Has anyone heard of the Titan submarine? That's why, you know, when you think about the Titan, did anyone see in the newspaper the attitude of their CEO towards regulations and standards? Were they for it or against it? Yes. Very much against it. So they had a view that innovation required avoiding some standards and regulations. And actually, I think quite the opposite. I think our role as young engineers, especially you, um, the next generation, is we come up with new technologies. We can influence and divide, you know, kind of design the regulatory pathway we can influence the regulators and how we think about it and have a very thoughtful conversation about it. So the purpose of the course is uh, to really go through each one of these elements in detail. But I like to always set it up with a journey of one patient and kind of make it salient as well for you. It's like everyone, there's someone who's behind the scenes that we're trying to help. And so today we're gonna look at this gentleman's brain and a condition that he has called intention tremor. And I'll start out by showing you what his condition is like without any technology involved. So this is a case study from a, co a colleague of mine and collaborator, Aisha Gundes at the University of Florida. So this is the gentleman. He goes about his activity of daily living, his dominant left hand uh, side. So he's going to pour a cup of water. You can see the more intention he has towards pouring the water, the more he actually spills. And so if he goes about his daily life trying to brush his teeth, trying to eat, anytime he's trying to actually manipulate his hand, the more he's trying to control his hand, the more it shakes. And so this prevents him from taking care of himself. And so we as engineers think about what can we do to improve his life. And this is just one patient's journey uh, of many, and so these are more the statistics. So in the, this is a snapshot of the UK about a decade ago, so it's actually trending even worse. Say so top row is the number of people impacted in a given year, anxiety disorders, 61 million people, 
uh, mood disorders such as depression, 30 plus million. The middle row is how much it's costing the healthcare system to take care of these uh, people. And then the bottom is the aggregate costs. So we're talking about even within one disease, a, a cost to the healthcare system of over 100 billion euros. And in the UK, just within that snapshot, the NHS is uh, spending over 100 billion pounds per year to treat neurological disorders. So there's an opportunity. You know, engineering is about identifying opportunity and trying to come up with solutions. Now, you're in the engineering department, and that's okay. But if I went out to you on the street, and I was a family member and said, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say we're gonna to try to treat a brain disorder? Would you think of tech? What would be the first thing that you'd maybe think of that you would apply? Incision. Surgery? That's a, you're my kind of person. <laughs> that's a, that's a, the, um, so brain surgery on the condition, but just standard, like one of you has, say, excessive migraines. Let's you know, make it realistic. So you've got excessive migraines. Would you necessarily think of an electronic solution? Pharmaceuticals. So what's going on with pharmaceuticals? You know, you know, why not pharma? So this is a plot that the pharma community put together. Uh, and also, it's about 10 years, so we need to update it. But you can see this was over many decades, from the 1950s to 2010. The y-axis is the number of drugs released for a billion dollars of US investment. And the x-axis is time going by. Is this a good trend? No, it's an awful trend. So pharma is actually struggling to come up with some new interventions. Now, in the past you know, five, 10 years, especially the vaccines for the COVID pandemic, they are actually starting to make innovations. So I don't wanna completely throw pharma under the bus, but they have had challenges coming up with solutions to treat disorders of the nervous system. And they even make fun of themselves. This is not me, they call it E-Room's Law. Now, why would they, it's called this E-Room's Law, and I gave a hint. Moore's, Moore's Law backwards. So for you uh, younger budding engineers to make this very graphical for you, this is a chip that would have been designed the year I was born and how big it would be. And this is how that same chip would evolve over time based on innovations in the electronics industry, which is the Moore's Law from Gordon Moore at Intel. Now it's not that they stopped innovating in 2014, it's that it no longer fits on a pixel. So we just can't draw it anymore. And so our opportunity as engineers is to complement what's going on in the pharmaceutical industry and think about the application of electricity and electronics. Can we leverage Moore's Law for the treatment of neurological disorders? Now, electricity in the body has been explored for a long time. This is Galvani and Volta. So in terms of copper, zinc, two dissimilar metals in a saline environment, creates a battery. Then they put it across a frog's leg and make it twitch. Arguably a parlor trick for many, many years, but then actually a revolution occurred in the 1960s where transistors allowed us to shrink the electronics down to a scale that we could implant it in the body and take advantage of the transistor technology to get more precise locations for activation, create a pattern and code into the body and get the timing just right. And the cardiac pacemaker is actually kind of the lead application that rode this revolution. So they started out with vacuum tube circuits, almost as big as this desk. And then when transistors came along, the founder of the company I worked at for 15 years, Earl Bakken, used a metronome circuit, a two transistor metronome circuit and shrunk it from the table down into something just a little bit bigger than your phone and it could run off a battery and it completely revolutionized the field. And so as I say, this is one example, you know, thinking about the cardiac pacemaker of electronics in the body. There actually are a large number of therapies that are out there today. We're gonna go deep into the discussion of brain stimulators where we do a lot of research at Oxford there are also uh, visual prosthetics, cochlear prosthetics. There's implants that help to treat incontinence and sleep apnea now, as well as chronic pain. And so there are all these electronics that are being implanted in the body. But one of the things we discuss as engineers is the notion that technology stack, where a lot of these 
uh, innovations have come from have really focused on the stimulation side and the interface to the body. So how can I put information into the nervous system and kind of drive it, but we might be missing an opportunity. And that's really the focus of today. What else could we do other than just driving information in? Think about having a one-way conversation on the ride home and you're not gonna do any listening and any response. Okay. So even with an actuator, where are we today? So this is a little snapshot of kind of, if you went up to the JR and uh, sat down with the tremor patient, like the, our subject of the day, they have a brain implant. And on the left, the device is turned off. On the right, the device is turned on. And you can see as they go about their activity of daily living, with the device on, they're actually doing better, but they're actually still struggling. I would not say this is perfect. This is not perfect yet. So as a you know, new engineer, I'd say, let's just turn it up. You know, why would we not just keep turning up the amplitude of the stimulation? Any intuitions about what might be bad about that? In the back here. Yeah. Shock, and it's actually the kind of the equivalent of the shock. It's it'll eventually because of where they put this device in his in his brain, which is this is next level, and the thalamus. If we turn up the amplitude, we'll actually start to get paresthesia, which is the feeling that funny uh, pins and needles prick you get when you hit your funny bone. So we'll have that, it will also impact your speech, start to get a frog in his throat called dysarthria. And so we were challenged as engineers working with physicians to find this window, kind of a window of a, and make it as big as possible between when you start to get a good response to the disease symptoms, but the upper limit is when you start to actually get side effects that work against you. And so we're always thinking about ways to improve that therapeutic window to do a better job of treating these patients. Now from a history lesson, it's kind of fun. Um, you know, they got started and this is a lot of engineering is repurposing technology. This is the battery. This is what it looks like inside of someone's chest. So the energy source, a little circuit board. These are wires that are then tunneled up through the neck and it is repurposed from a cardiac pacemaker, which used to go down to the right ventricle. And those leads go up, a hole's drilled in your head and the stereotactic neurosurgeon places those electrodes. And what they were doing in this first generation of technology is replacing a surgical lesion where they actually destroy the tissue with a pattern of stimulation. So it was disrupting kind of this pathological rhythm in your brain with constant background stimulation. And so what was nice is they could adjust it. The problem is if you destroy brain tissue, you're done. There's no going back. And so this actually gave them the ability to fine tune the therapy a little bit. But the problem, and this is why as engineers, we have to choose our language very carefully, as they called it a reversible lesion. So this, and so it was okay to get people to embrace it and say, okay, I understand what a lesion is, but lesions are static. You know, think about a lesion and it just doesn't change and that we kind of miss an opportunity with the static mindset. And so this is the, where we spend a lot of time in this class is pushing out the technology stack. And by that I mean thinking about sensors, classifiers, control policies that can actually listen through an interface to the nervous system and adjust the stimulator. Thinking much more about this like a dynamic system, almost a replacement part for the brain, as I use this in kind of a high level, uh, high level you know, community talks. Now I'm gonna give you some intuition because I don't like to lose people at this point. So you're all familiar with this idea of a technology stack as I've drawn it. Home boiler regulator. So where we are today is we have our actuator. This is kind of a brain stimulator. And think about your boiler. You got a tank of water, gas underneath. Uh, I'll have to adjust this for heat pumps in the future, but the concepts are still there. So you got your gas burner heating up boiling water. Today's therapies, when it's stimulation only, it's like having your burner set to the same BTU output, no matter what the weather or the season. So some days it's too hot, some days it's too low. You just try to get the best average and that's tough. So the way we fix that, well, how would you fix it? I'm giving you a little, you know, so here's the tank of water Add a thermometer. So we're gonna add a sensor. 
Then the classifier is to say, here's our set point. Are you above it or below it? If you're above it, the control policy, the action you take based on how you're classifying yourself based on where you want to be, is to say, oh, I'm too hot, turn off the gas. Oh, I'm too, it's too low of temperature, turn the gas on. So these are the core elements that we explore in the class together and go in depth is what are the sensors, classifiers, and control policies that we might be able to apply to improve the actuation. So this is the intuition. So make sure everyone generally have the picture. Boiler regulator. You'll never look at your home boiler the same. So, okay. So one of the big issues is in neuroscience today, what are the surrogate concepts of a sensor, classifier, and control policy? We're trying to help that gentleman we saw who's spilling water all over the place. How do we actually close the loop? He's got his stimulator, so we've got the actuator in place. Well, let's step through it together. The first is to think about a sensor. So we've got signals that are available to us from the brain. And this is a snapshot from a colleague where we can say measure EEG off the surface. We can measure local field potentials, which are kind of the average signals coming off of electrodes. If you have the right type, you can get individual spikes, look at, listen to one neuron, or you can lay a grid over the top of the head. And that will actually give you kind of the ensemble activity underneath the motor cortex. So we tend to, in the brain implants, work a lot with measuring the local field potentials as well as the put an electrode over the surface for ECOG. Now even if you're focusing on those two, the way you extract information is also a thought. So one is to evoke a potential. So I can say put an electrode over your auditory cortex, listen for the response. And so that's one area that's under a lot of research right now is these evoke potentials, kind of creating a stimuli, looking how does your brain response. Like in, if you want to measure someone's con consciousness level, one of the areas is they'll give a little ping to your cortex and they look at how does it propagate and spread across the brain. And using the same algorithm that they use to zip up a file, they call it zipping up your brain signal and they use that as a measure of your consciousness. The other modality is to look at sensory motor rhythms. So the baseline rhythms in the brain. So all of you have these oscillations, these sinusoids that are going through in different regions of your brain. And so the analogy that I use is kind of a burst of oscillation and then it comes and goes. So this is the frequency, like an AM radio dial, and then the amount of power in the signal, that will modulate based on what you're thinking or doing at any given time. And so the way to think about it, if we're gonna, we're gonna focus on those rhythms together, is it's like music. So we're looking at specific frequencies, just turn this sideways, and how the energy at that specific frequency band comes and goes over time. So like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, I can look at the oscillations and how they're coming and going in specific parts of your brain and decode it. And when the analogy of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony comes up, I know whether to take action or not. Okay. So one of the first things we need to do, thinking as engineers, is get confidence that the technology is reliable and ready to go in a home environment. And so one of the research projects I was privileged to be part of, we actually went into a uh, patient in the Netherlands who had um, Lou Gehrig syndrome, ALS, and she had lost her ability to move. However, they're still conscious like you are. So imagine a world where they call this locked in state where you cannot move and take action, but you're able to listen and process information just like today. So to help her out with communication, we put an electrode over the motor cortex that signals would actually have that oscillation that would wax and wane based on whether she was thinking about moving her hand. So we could listen to that frequency band. This is the note of primary interest, around 20 hertz. So when she wanted to communicate something that she would see on her screen, say like select this letter K, she would think about moving her right hand, 
that note would go from a lot of volume to low volume. We would detect that change in the brain's oscillation and use that to select the letter. And so a lot of the brain computer interfaces that you see today are based on this principle of listening to a core signal. The details are dependent on the technology and the application, but that's the core principle. We can listen to the characteristics of the brain signals and based on their modulation, use that to adjust the design in real time. So coming back to our patient that we're trying to help, we're gonna put this electrode over the motor cortex. So the surgeon's gonna put an electrode over their motor cortex related to their hand. That's the sensor. And then we're gonna listen and when they're resting, just like you, I put an electrode, I won't put an electrode in your head, but in the class we actually put electrodes on the top of our heads. We can actually see this background oscillation you're just humming along. When you're falling asleep, I can actually tell that as well. It goes to a lower frequency. Um, and then when you start to move, that oscillation, uh, for now, hold this thought, goes away. So that's our classifier. We can actually look for that very much like our boiler thermostat. Say, ah, when I have... My, when I'm at rest and I think about motion, I have a lot of energy at that note. I can turn the stimulator off. That's our control policy. And then when it goes away, aha, they must be thinking about moving. Thinking about moving so I know I can turn the stimulator on. And that's how we can control the gentleman's stimulator now in real time. So let's come back to our subject, see where he was doing. So that we'll start with the baseline again, just so it's top of your head. So this is with the device, his brain regulator is basically turned off. And so his baseline state of motion goes to pour his water and he's struggling with it. Now we're gonna enable this an analogy of the brain regulator. It's gonna modify the stimulation going through his thalamus, trying to optimize it by triggering how it's responding in real time based on his intention to move. And so the red bar is synchronized with the movie. This is the raw signal that's coming off of the surface of his brain over his hand motion. When he puts his hand down, the note's energy goes up. Then when he starts to move again, that oscillation goes away and we know to turn on the stimulator. And so what's fascinating about this as an engineer is with me as a circuit designer, working with the control theorists, the neurologists and the neurosurgeons, we're basically building new networks in the brain and then fine tuning the software to treat disease. So it's a very rewarding area. And this is, I show this example in the class and actually to use a demo because you can very clearly see what's going on. But similar techniques are used now for treating Parkinson's disease, um, and epilepsy, and then they're in research for uh, the treatment of depression and OCD. So let's come back to pharma, because I don't, like I said, my intent is to actually not throw pharma under the bus. We have to work together. So one of the hallmark signs of Parkinson's is the inability to move, called akinesia, so you can't move, or slow movement, bradykinesia. But you can also end up in this state. And now would you say this, this gentleman, this is from my colleague, Phil Starr at UCSF, who shared this video. Would you say that he was suffering from an absence of motion? No. In fact, he's at the other extreme. He's at the other bookend. So what's fascinating is as we build these devices and deploy them and try to work on new therapies, we also make new discoveries. And so in this case, I wasn't... 100% truthful for you when I was saying at this specific note, yes, the signal went away. But by having, in Phil's case, you know, a similar setup where the electro was over the motor cortex, he actually found that when the patients became dyskinetic, there was a new note. It was just at a different frequency. And so in the same concept of the regulator, when Phil sees this note, on his patients, 
he knows he's providing a combination of too much medication and too much stimulation. So they're actually starting to lose control of their emotions, become unstable. And so he uses that to say, aha, that's my thermostat signal. DBS is too high, turn it down. And so we're really at an exciting time of getting, you know, making discoveries on the brain's operation and how we can apply therapies. So I know we start at five minutes late. I'm gonna give you three minutes back. So can I take two more to make a key, a key point? Because I want the students to walk out with an important lesson. Are we done? Is this design complete? No. So I'm not in the interest of time. I always have an error on my boiler whenever we turn on, you know, new uh, in the winter when we start to turn on the, the grates because there's air pockets. And so if the water go, falls out of the boiler, you'll actually wreck the, the, wreck the actual pan. The other issue is what if I turn on the gas but the flame doesn't light up? You have protection modes. There's risk management involved in the system. And those same risk managements, are, these are the standards we talk about. We talked about the Titan submarine. A key part of the class is to step through, I'm just going to flash it, a whole framework of how we analyze a design, think about how it can go wrong, and build in acceptable risk mitigations. Because we've showed the examples from the patients and how we're doing these exploratory therapies for them. But a very important side of this is when we deploy these technologies into a home environment, we know that they're going to be safe. We're not going to actually send them out. We're going to make sure that they have all kinds of fallbacks and, and uh, design limits that keep them uh, protected. So just to wrap up, you know, we walked a bit. I know it was a fast one, but think about this as the thermostat, the equivalent of technology stack and how we might be able to apply it for a number of diseases. The opportunity space for us as engineers is vast. We were, the healthcare system, the NHS needs us. I was just on a phone call this morning with the NHS physicians, you know, dealing with chronic pain, and they need technologies from engineers like you. They need fresh ideas. Uh, my role is to help you figure out the way to do that, but most importantly, to see the world through this complete lens and not just come up with a technical solution, but one that never gets there. But can you come up with something that solves a clinical problem, is reliable, meets standards, and is economically viable? So with that, I will let you go, because um, I know you're on a pretty tight uh, schedule, but I will stick around to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.